you at baptism, and who received your body and blood as blessed food upon this path to eternity. Be worthy to meet you with radiant faces. May they rest in your heavenly Jerusalem, the city of the saints, in the dwellings of light and joy. Now, Lord, we implore you with the fragrance of the incense, and with alms, prayers, and sacrifices offered on their behalf, to exalt them on your spiritual altar. Be pleased with what we have offered, and prepare us to share in the dwellings of joy to which we have been invited through the abundance of your mercy and because of our perfect faith in you. We glorify you, your Father and your Holy Spirit, now and forever.
the first letter of St. Paul to Thessalonians. Glory to the Lord of all the apostles. May the mercy of God descend upon the reader, listeners, and upon this parish, and the children forever. Brothers and sisters, concerning times and seasons, you have no need for anything to be written to you. For you yourselves know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief at night, when people are saying, peace and security. Then sudden disaster comes upon them, like labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you, brothers and sisters, are not in darkness, for that day to overtake you like a thief, for all of you are children of the light, and children of the dead. We are not of night or of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as the rest do, but let us stay alert and sober. Those who sleep go to sleep at night, and those who are drunk get drunk at night. But since we are of the day, let us be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and the helmet that is hope for salvation. For God did not destine us for wrath, but to gain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up, as indeed you do. Praise be to God always. And from Sheol, 
where he was in torment, he raised his eyes and he saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. And he cried out, Father Abraham, have pity on me. Send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water to cool my tongue, for I am suffering torment in these flames. And Abraham replied, My son, remember that you received what was good during your lifetime, while Lazarus received what was bad. But now he is comforted here, whereas you are being tormented. Moreover, between us there is a great chasm that prevents anyone from crossing who might wish to go from our side to yours or from your side to ours. But he said, Then I beg you, Father, send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, so that he might warn them, lest they also come to this place of torment. But Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. And he said, But no, Father Abraham, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. Then Abraham said to him, If they will not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither shall they be persuaded if someone should rise even from the dead. This is the truth, peace be with you. It finds itself in the Gospel of St. Luke among all of a series of aphorisms and teachings and parables. Just one thing after another, St. Luke compiles them all together. And in the middle of this, you have this reminder that God teaches, and everything you need to know is already with Moses and the prophets, he tells the Jews. But he's also announcing that even if one rises from the dead, they won't believe which, of course, becomes the case. But what I'd like us to do, actually, with this week of all souls, of all the faithful departed, is to use the occasion at this moment, annually, to talk about what our customs are surrounding death as Maronites. Because it's clear that we're losing grip on our tradition. We're losing the vision of what we are meant to do. And the Maronites are very specific and very ancient and we can even say Jewish traditions, they're so old. So the first thing to remind everyone is about the sacrament of extreme unction. The sacrament of extreme unction, the sacred anointing, is a preparation for those who are gravely ill, from some internal reason, they're not soldiers going to war, but someone who is in danger of death. And that can be illness, that can be old age, when someone becomes very frail and they're in danger of dying, you call in, as St. James says in his epistles, you call in the priests, and they anoint. 
And what the anointing does is both a forgiveness of sins, but what it's primarily doing is an anointing of senses, the eyes, the ears, the nostrils, the mouth, all of the things by which we chose badly during our life, our sins. The hands are anointed. The feet are anointed. Well, the feet, they stopped kind of in the middle of the 20th century. Though, I have had people, for the obvious reason that you have to pull sheets up off of beds. And so it just became something that became more difficult. But I have had people who have said, no, 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 please, let us do this. And to anoint the top of the feet that carried us to all the places we should not have gone, or taken us away from places that we should have been, and then up until the end of the 19th century, you used to also anoint the kidneys to roll Grandpa over or have him sit forward in his chair. Because the kidneys in the classical world were considered to be the seat of the passions of lust, of our impurities. And that was done up until, as I said, the end of the 19th century. And the Maronites specifically, what we do for the senses is we anoint from the forehead to the chin from the ears across the eyes, so that you cover all the senses in one huge anointing across the face. But the purpose is the same. It's a purification of all of the senses that we have sinned by. And that's why even a person who's blind will still have their eyes anointed. Not that they have seen anything, but of course there are things that we desire to see which are sinful. And so all of the senses are anointed of everyone, even if they didn't function. Because, of course, the will is a sovereign part of our life that we choose to do or not to do things. And I remind everyone of this because there's not a single word about death in the sacred anointing. It doesn't mention death. It is not, strictly speaking, last rites. There is kind of a strange cultural aspect about if you call the priest in to anoint, somehow you have admitted that mom's dying. But that is not what the basis of the sacrament is for. The basis is actually about healing. And if it is because they are in danger of death, if it is God's will that they do leave this world and pass beyond the veil, as all of us are going to do, there's nothing we can do to stop death. But there's everything we can do to make death become beautiful and radiant with grace. That's a big difference. So we must not allow ourselves to succumb to the terror and the fear by which the world functions. Death is something that we embrace because we know that death is inseparable from resurrection. And so as I mentioned in the sacred anointing, there is no word of death. But in the te teaching of the church, this anointing, if it is God's will that this person die, it prepares them for the beatific vision by purification of them. The last rites, strictly speaking, are the next stage in which you receive the Holy Eucharist as viaticum, we call it. Viaticum is the Latin word for something via, you take on the way, tecum with you. It's actually the word they used to use for essentially picnics you took when you were traveling long distances. It wasn't like you found McDonald's every six miles. And so the via tecum was what you took along to give you nourishment on the journey. And so that last reception as part of the last rites is actually the viaticum. You receive the Eucharist for the last time. And then there is the apostolic blessing. The apostolic see, the papacy, has, designated, has delegated to every single Catholic priest throughout the world to give in his name a blessing which is the full remission of plenary indulgence of all the temporal punishment due to our sins. So we have been cleansed by sins. We go to confession, we are cleansed in the sacred anointing. And then when the moment of our death comes, we receive the Eucharist as viaticum. And that is actually a grave obligation. If someone purposely chose not to receive the Eucharist before their death, that would be considered a mortal sin. That's how important viaticum is. But I'm afraid that, as we say, we lose because we have Hollywood, we have movies, we have the social media. We have begun to actually manipulate and change our way of, of, of death to become what the world does. We destroy the bodies of our dead, we have celebrations of life, we do not have masses offered for them. We are losing grips. And to understand how beautiful our traditions are and how consoling they are, 
both to the living and to the one who is dying, is a shame if we lose it. And so that apostolic blessing is the blessing of the Pope delegated to every single priest to be given in those last moments to give them full remission of all the temporal punishments. That's referring to the purgations that follow after life. And then there are the prayers of the dying. There is a whole litany of the prayers of the dying. So it is because it's all souls that I wanted to discuss these things but also because we have this beautifully happen on Friday. Because David Burke died on Friday. That's the third of our series of the three in the last two weeks. And Janet called me in the morning, and I had the, I had the ability after the Mass, after the Catechism, to go and see him. At this point, he was actually already moving beyond the veil. He was not responsive. But during the prayers, this is why when you, when you have someone who is dying, you speak to them, you pray with them. Don't just stand in the room and talk about them. Hearing is one of the last things you lose. And even as the anointing was taking place, even though David could not respond, there was a fluttering of the eyes, and I'm not at all certain that that was nothing other than his way to react, that he knew we were all there even if he could no longer speak. It is very important. And so after the anointing was done and the apostolic blessing was given to him, before I left the room, I went down next to his ear at his bedside, at his pillow, and I said, David, please when you enter into the divine light, remember to pray for us at St. Joseph's. And he died an hour and a half later. That's the way you do it. He had received Holy Communion a few days before, our subdeacon had gone out to see him. This is the beauty that comes with these things. And then in the Maronite tradition, we would sit Shiva. Now if you have Orthodox friends, and even the Orthodox Christians, the Orthodox, sit Shiva. Shiva actually is the Hebrew word for seven. There would be seven formal days of mourning from the point of death. Because what would happen is the body would be prepared at home. And yes, oftentimes all you had that was big enough to put the body on was your dining room table. And that was fine. You covered everything over. And every, every generation had those aunts who knew the traditions of how to modestly and respectfully wash the body, redress, and prepare them for Shiva, for the wake. The way it was keeping watch. Now the burial of the body would take place within 24 hours, 36 hours. It would be done, for obvious reasons, it would be done quickly. To this day, the Muslims still bury, try to bury, the Jews still try to bury their dead within 24 hours of death. It's also out of respect. But Shiva is the wake that you have with the family when they sit quietly, you come to their homes, because again, we're used to doing funeral homes. I think I've told at least some of you that when I went to study in Europe, funeral homes were still new in the 1980s in Europe. They were still laying their dead out. And on the day that I arrived at the seminary in Switzerland, one of the sisters had died. And that was the first time I had seen a wake done in the classic manner. The sisters came in, they wash and they prepare modestly, discreetfully, respectfully, sister's body, garb the body again in a clean habit, and place the body back and change the linens on the bed that she died in, place the body back in the bed, and that night we kept wake. So the seminarians, the sisters, the priests, coming through to that room, praying for the dead that night. And in the morning, the body was lifted by the seminarians and placed into the coffin, and we processed with the prayers that went down to the chapel, down to the church, for her funeral mass. And then from there was the procession from the church to the crypt where she was buried on the seminary grounds. This is why in the Maronite tradition there are a huge amount of prayers and hymns that are sung and psalms on the escorting the dead from their home to the cemetery. And always remembering that cemetery means dormitory. 
This is why we do not destroy the bodies of the dead. We lay them to rest. They are laid to rest in the dormitory. And that is not just because of the vision of the resurrection. The Jews and Christians have never burned their dead unless it's a plague or something, or war, or some other destructive aspect of massacres. And the reason why they've done that is not just because of the vision of the resurrection, but also because of the full respect paid to the integrity of the human being, who is body, soul, and spirit. The bodies are anointed, they are incensed in the genes, because of the respect that we have for the integrity of the human being, who is material and immaterial. And this is why, in fact, for us, cremation was only allowed in 1963. And being allowed, Rome also reiterated in 2016 to remind us that cremation is not the norm for getting rid of dead people. But it is allowed for economic reasons, for other serious reasons. But the norm in 2016, not that long ago, in Francis' Rome, there was the reminder that the norm of the burial is the burial of the bodies. And the full ceremonies that surround the bodies are not only that they are anointed before death, but that as the body lay in wake, we have the ceremony that we call jinnas, which is an incense ceremony for prayers. And remember, the incense is a purification rite in the Eastern Church, especially for the Syrian tradition. Incense of its very thing is a forgiveness of sins. And so for the actual proper passage from this world, we have Jinnah as the body would be taken to the cemetery, and then the Mass would be offered for the dead on one of the days that followed after, on the third because of our Lord's resurrection on the third day, or upon the ninth day, because of the novena between the ascension of our Lord and the day of Pentecost, of course, and on the 40th day. The 40th day we remembered for the most part. But these masses would be offered, and then we have what we call the mercy meal. Now the question becomes, is why do we have a mercy meal? We call it a mercy meal, which is a strange word for a reception if it's just a family luncheon. The reason why we call it a mercy meal is the meal was put on as an act of alms, as an act of compassion. So essentially, when your grandfather died in the village, you had a meal after the Mass, not because it's a family luncheon now, but because you fed the village in the name of the deceased. It was an act of alms. There is nothing private as far as ceremonies go in the Catholic Church. Every wedding is a public event. Because I've had people say, they didn't come to Mass on one day, well, because there was a wedding going on. You can come to Mass. Ah, it's up to them to invite you to their party, which is the reception. That's a different thing. But to be present at the Mass is a public event. To be present at the funeral to pray for the dead is a public event. And technically the Mercy Meal is also a public event. And in fact, we had far more food than we needed yesterday. You could have all been there and also benefited. But this is the reason why those masses are then offered. And then, of course, you have the anniversary that follows. But when we have the burial and the recent observances, we have the body that is brought in. It is greeted at the church because this is the last time this individual, even in death, enters into the house of God. And they are greeted, there is an insensation of the coffin, they are blessed. If you destroy the body, you destroy the major part of the ceremony. That's why we don't do jinnahs in the cemetery over bodies that have already decomposed and have disintegrated into ashes. To destroy the bodies early is a shame. It's, a, it's allowed. There's nothing morally wrong with it. But please don't make it a norm. When I was in Fall River in our Maronite parish, I did a number of funerals. But I did many more funerals in Fall River than I've done up here, even after four years. But everyone brought us a body. Everyone had the full ceremonies of insensation, of jinnahs, of consecration. Because the body lays at the, at the front of the bima during that divine Eucharist for the last time also. 
And at the end of the Mass, when we have the body present, we venerate that temple of the Holy Spirit by the incensation on the four sides of the coffin and the prayers that are done. And then you escort also with prayers the body for its last time leaving the house of God. And to understand the beauty of the Maronite traditions, if it's a priest, the priest is actually his body is facing away from the altar towards the people, as he has always done facing the people. But before that body leaves of the priest, leaves the church, that coffin is raised up by the other priest, the pallbearers, usually priest, and it is actually circumambulated, walked around the altar three times, like he has done so many times during his life in the Husoye. And then the coffin is taken out. Please don't reduce us to celebrations of life and absent bodies and mere memorial services with photographs. It's not the photographs, they're fine. But it is the anointed and consecrated body that the Jews and the Christians have always understood. It is this that will rise from the dead. And while cremating bodies does not destroy the possibility of the resurrection, of course, the vision of the church is that this is the whole body. This is the whole person, body, soul, and spirit. And therefore, the mercy meals, the alms. If you read the prayers again in the Missal this week, it talks about how we offer prayers and alms and our asceticism for the benefit of the dead. These are the intercessions. This is the way that we continue to pray for the dead. You have the picture on the front of the bulletin of the little figure in the ship, and on the ship there's a table. The table is actually an altar, and on the altar is the Eucharist. And the dead, he's surrounded completely with this image of fire all around in his passage from this world to the heavenly Jerusalem. This is why we pray. So I just wanted to take occasion for this week of all souls, which is a very beautiful thing, not just one day, but an entire week. And in our tradition, this would be the week. I mean, it's hard in Maine because it's winter time. But this would be the time that you would visit the cemeteries of your dead, that you would spiffy them up, that you would pray for the dead, and that you pray for all of those who repose in the cemetery waiting for the day of glory of our Lord's return, which is very much our Syrian spirituality. The coming of our Lord is mentioned in every single anaphora, waiting for the end of the world, Maranatha. And so, take these things to heart, cherish them as the true traditions of our heritage as Maronites, and then put them into full practice and the beauty and the consolation that comes with the Catholic faith. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen.
your church, that we may raise glory and thanks to you, to your only Son and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Thanks to your holy altar of God. Thanks to the holy mysteries placed upon you. Peace to you, O minister of God. Tell me, thou caught 
have been redeemed by the death of your only Son, and on that day when all are rescued from death, delivered from the realm of the dead, and raised from the dust of the grave, the grace of our only, your only Son, will have been glorified in us and in them. Through him we hope to find mercy and forgiveness for our sins and for theirs. <laughs> Resurrection on the last day when all is renewed. Make us and our departed worthy through your grace of the joy of your heavenly kingdom. In all us and in all things your blessed and most honored name be glorified, praised, and exalted. With the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and of your living Holy Spirit, now and forever.
lover of all people, have mercy on us. Have mercy on us, O Lord, for compassion and mercy. For love for all people, have mercy on us. Holy Father, our mouths accustomed to earthly food, give you thanks for your grace that has made us worthy of this heavenly food, the body and blood of your only Son. Through him and with him, glory, power, and honor are due to you and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Christ, you are the heavenly bread who came down and became for us the food that does not perish. At your second coming, may we not become the food of the imperishable fire. 
We raise glory and thanks to you, to your Father, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Go in peace, my beloved brothers and sisters, with the nourishment and blessings you have received from the forgiving altar of the Lord. May the blessing of the Most Holy Trinity accompany you, Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the one God, to whom be glory forever. Amen.